of the book I had the privilege of uh, editing. It was published several months ago by Springer. And again, I had the honor of working with some really fantastic clinicians. And the idea behind that book was you don't just you know, start prepping teeth and putting in uh, restorations. Is proper planning is critical to everything. You have to look at the uh, way that orthodontics would be uh, done prior to treatment, whether any periodontal procedure should be done prior to treatment, whether crown lengthening, uh, uh, grafting, and uh, different things like that. You have to look at color. You have to understand how to use uh, photography properly properly. And you have to learn how to uh, speak to your laboratory, which is very critical, and discuss the case, take pictures, and discuss with the case with your laboratory uh, technician or technicians, and find out which material would be uh, best for that particular case. And you have to prepare the teeth uh, accordingly, depending on the case and the material selected. And again, I want to thank, I have to thank a lot of people. Uh, all these people uh, have worked at NYU and the uh, international, uh, the all international dentists that we work with in the uh, program, they're from all over the world. Uh, Bhavna and uh, Maria uh, both helped me at the uh, Greater New York Dental Meeting uh, presenting over the last couple of years. Uh, Maria for the first two years and Bhavna last year. Uh, Ash, uh, that's us. Uh, I might use the nickname, it's a little bit easier for me, uh, was the, they were, all, uh, were fellows except for uh, Jay, who was the last patient, uh, person. Uh, she's from uh, Thailand actually, and she went on to the dental materials lecture. So all the material with the cases were cases that they did at school. So I want to thank them for the excellent uh, work and the documentation they did that made it uh, better for me to elaborate on different concepts in the uh, program. Go back again. The lecture outline today, first we're going to discuss the basic principles of aesthetics, just to give you a highlight. And I think you had forward to you several articles that will give you more detail of some of the aesthetic principles that would be involved. The ones that were published in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry uh, that I did with Dr. Montalvo and also the one uh, that I did with Dr. Montalvo in uh, dental clinics are probably one of the uh, ones that go over the more aesthetic uh, details. And then we'll be discussing the main topic today is of course on veneers. Why do we do veneers? There's uh, different reasons. One, type one would be, and this is, again, it's not only about me. I get information from a lot of different sources. So I build on the information. Um, I do a lot of reading. I do listen to a lot of uh, great lectures and uh, some of the books. This is uh, from a book by uh, Ron Goldstein and with the chapter that Dr. Uh, Stappert uh, wrote. And he has talked about moderate discoloration uh, with the teeth. Uh, could be just small discoloration or could be major discoloration, tetracycline uh, staining, it could be fluorosis. Uh, it could be anatomical malformations, uh, it could be peg-shaped laterals. You might want to correct the position of the teeth. Uh, they might be rotated and the patients might not want to undergo orthodontics, even though that would be the ideal treatment would do some minor orthodontics prior to uh, some of the uh, treatment because you maintain as much of the tooth structure as possible. Also extensive damage or changes in form would be reasons you would do the veneers. This is from an article that uh, was from uh, Dr. Calamia, uh, not Dr. Calamia, uh, Dr. Coachman, Dr. Calamita, and a bunch you see in the upper right, the list of the authors with this. This is the concept of vitrogenism. And the chapter that uh, Dr. Gorell wrote in my book expands upon this aspect here. It goes back to years ago when we used to select teeth for dentures, talking about triangular, oval, rectangular. This is more based on personality of the patient, that if the patient's sensible, uh, melaconic, you want to have more oval, and you can read some of the uh, details of what type of teeth you would select, and triangular would be a little bit different, be a more dynamic personality, uh, and rectangular, uh, strong uh, personality, and also the square would be more 
of a calm personality. Just get a little water. With uh, Dr. Varel's chapter, what he does is he has a list of uh, questions that he asks the uh, uh, patients. And uh, from that list of questions, it's fed into uh, uh, AI computer. And the computer figures out what would be the best uh, configuration for that patient's uh, teeth based on the questions that they answered. Uh, from that, a, a digital design is uh, done on a computer and then a mock-up or provisional prototype can be made, put into patient's mouth, and they could assess, you know, what the possible results would be. And what's nice about this, you could modify that at that particular point in time. Let's say they want um, more deeper incisal embrasures, straight across, uh, different aspects could be modified on the, uh, uh, that uh, mock-up and uh, then reincorporate it into another trial that could be elaborated on before prepping the teeth and making a final restoration. So as close as possible, you want to get to what the patient would like ultimately and achieve with the final restorations. So it doesn't totally eliminate all mistakes, but it'll, hopefully it will marginalize any particular problems. Okay, when we first go meet the patient, these are things we have to look at. And I'm gonna go into more detail with step-by-step -step when we do the cases, things that we look at at NYU, there's a step-by-step -step analysis. Uh, this is from the, some of the work by Dr. Steve Chu and uh, Dr. Stappett, and talking about with the incisal embrasures are increased, at least normally some patients might not want it, or sometimes they have too much embrasures and they wanna eliminate or minimize them, so you have to discuss that with the patient. But you can see the incisal embrasures increase as you go posteriorly. And you see the contacts decrease as you go posteriorly. But also you have to look at the papilla. Uh, they're gonna be about 40% in the ideal situation. But if you're dealing with implants, a combination of implants and veneers, it might change the uh, quotient. And the patient has to be aware of that before you start. And if they have a high smile line, this could be problematic. If they don't have a smile line, I would still mention it to patient because a lot of patients pull their lips back afterward and say, oh, this is terrible. I never had that before. And it might be what existed at right from the beginning. I want to look at the tooth proportion. Again, this is from uh, Dr. Chu's uh, analysis, and X is the width of the central. Uh, X minus two is the width of the lateral incisor. X minus one would be the width of the uh, canine. And that's how you would determine the proper width. And you could talk about, you know, if you'd go with orthodontics and move four mouths rehabilitation. And I'll show you a case later where the top and bottom are done. You might want to look at the Bolton analysis. Uh, and that's not the Bolton who's uh, just wrote the book about Trump. It's the Bolton analysis that gives you the ratio between the uh, top and bottom teeth that sometimes to ascertain uh, the proper dimensions, where they do it digitally, where the lab does a wax up conventionally. Also, you want to look at the proportion of the teeth. Uh, ideally, it should be about 80% for the central it could be range anywhere from 75 to 85, but ideal would be, you know, 8 to 10 proportion. You also want to look at the zenith point. That's the highest point uh, in the uh, gingival margin. On the centrals, usually it's located to the distal. Um, on the laterals, and again, according to Steve Chu, uh, and uh, it would be middle of the laterals and canines used to be distally on the uh, canines but that remains to be seen but right now definitely the centrals the zenith point is to the distal and line angles could really make a big difference whether you're doing a direct composite or do veneers uh, moving the line angles could change the shape of the teeth and make them appear wider or narrower depending on the line angles and shading. So it's very critical that you uh, analyze that. Also, you're gonna look at the axial inclination of the teeth. 
it should be pretty much like I'm demonstrating over here. That would be the ideal axial inclination. Otherwise, you have to reduce the teeth a lot more to get them in alignment, or again, possibly consider orthodontic treatment, possibly with Invisalign or similar type of procedure, or full bands if uh, necessary. But it should be suggested to the uh, patient because you want to minimize the preparation of the uh, teeth. Also, we want to look at the contact points, as we mentioned before, the incisal edge ideally should be parallel uh, to the lower lip. That would be the ideal situation of the uh, incisal edge to the lower lip. And again, sometimes you might have, not everybody's created equal, you might have asymmetry. I know when I smile, one side goes up higher than the other. And that's why pictures and documenting uh, before you start treatment is very critical. Uh, you want to be able to show the patient these are the problems you have right now and what we're going to try to do to correct some of the uh, limitations. And some things you just can't do, you know, you have to have the patient aware of that. Uh, Dr. Coachman came out with the digital design concept and uh, there are some other similar programs. I know Mauro Fradiani has a, a program uh, it's not as well known, but he was kind enough to send me some of the information on that. I believe there's some others. I don't know what they use in Europe, if they use the uh, Coachman design or the uh, Mauro Fardiani's uh, design. But the basic- They use concept, both. They use both. What's that? They use both in Europe. They use both? both? Of them, yeah. Yeah, maybe we could discuss late advantages and disadvantages, but the, basically the concepts are the uh, same. Uh, with that, the aesthetic principle should be the uh, same. And whether you do a digital wax up uh, or do it manually, uh, this just basically converts everything to uh, digital. And that's where a lot of things are going now. It's uh, everything's going uh, digital, uh, not totally. And eventually it'll probably go totally. I know with implants, that's uh, very common uh, with that. But the advantage of that basically it improved the smile design process. And uh, basically you're having the patient as a co-author, you know, they're working together with you uh, in developing the smile. So you're not finalizing everything, you're developing everything digitally. Uh, and you want to sometimes talk to a periodontist or an orthodontist prior to that, uh, or incorporate it. I know with uh, the DSD incorporates with the orthodontic program. So you can work together with both. And ideally, I, I would like to show the patient what can be done orthodontically to minimize treatment. So I wanna treat, keep my preparations ideally in enamel. That's the best for long-term uh, result for the patient and for us too, that we don't have to redo these uh, cases and patients are unhappy. They say, well, I thought it would last, you know, at least you know, a couple of years and all of a sudden, you know, you're having a, uh, you know, a problem with that is because that's you're on, uh, you're not on enamel, you're on dentin, which I'm going to go into when we discuss bonding a little bit on bonding, because that would make the lecture even longer. Uh, so you want to integrate technology to make everything more clinically uh, uh, presenting to the patient. So you can give the idea of what their ultimate result will look like for the uh, patient. And this is from one of, uh, uh, the articles from Dr. Coachman and Dr. Calamita. Uh, and if you haven't read any of the articles, you should look at that. There's some excellent articles by uh, Marcello on uh, restoring vertical dimension, which I can mention a little bit later in the case. So it, uh, so they have some very informative articles on that. But you can see over here, he's making what uh, it's called the digital ruler. So you have a ruler incorporated into your system and you're measuring on the model the dimensions and you're transferring that to the digital ruler so it's accurate uh, to what the model has. So you could design uh, what your preparation will be like, whether you have to uh, do a, any crown lengthening, are you lengthening the teeth or are you moving uh, the uh, tissue up on that depends on the smile and where you want to end up or it might be a combination of both but you want to analyze that before and this is from the article that I believe was sent to you that I published with Dr. Montalvo and he did it with uh, actually with a uh, not with DSD but he made his own technique up using the Apple computer but 
again with the digital ruler and you can see over here that he has to measure where he wants the tissue to go. Dr. Montalvo is, uh, he's in Dubai right now. He's originally from Spain uh, and a uh, very talented dentist, but he's a periodontist in Spain. He took our program in aesthetics and now he does a lot of fantastic uh, cases. And he wrote one of the chapters in the book and it'll go into more detail of the concept of a crown lengthening, whether it's necessary, uh, osseous recontouring and so forth. That's beyond the scope of this particular lecture but often it's needed. If you have a high smile line, or at least tell the patient that it would be beneficial uh, to do that. Okay, uh, in preparing the teeth, whether you're doing for crown or veneer, you have to be aware of the biological width. Uh, the sulcus is, most people are pretty familiar with this, of 0.67, the epithelial attachment 0.97, and the connective tissue 1.07. You don't want to violate the biological width because uh, that could be a problem. You have uh, tissue will be constantly inflamed. And again, with the, I think it's the last slide I'm going to talk about in the article that I sent uh, everybody that was published in Compendium uh, at the beginning of the year, it talks about the pink and the white, because it's not just about the uh, restoration, whether it's a crown or a veneer, but also the uh, soft tissue should be like a background for the uh, veneers or crowns, whichever what you're doing, or direct composites. That's another viable alternative. Uh, with the veneer preparations, ideally you want to keep the veneer preparations in the enamel. You want to keep it in the enamel so you get the best bond to the enamel surface. Sometimes you have no choice. You might have some dentin exposed, uh, but the uh, enamel would be ideal. And if you have dentin exposed, you might want to look at uh, some of Pascal Magne's uh, work, talk about immediate dentin sealing uh, with that to seal the, uh, the dental surface, get a bend onto it. And recently I was aware of a presentation that uh, Pascal Magne uh, did, and he spoke about heating the bonding agent. And I believe, I don't know what month, unfortunately, it's going to be published in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry talking about heating the bonding agent, and that's the OptiBond uh, material. And he found the heating the bonding agent greatly, greatly uh, magnified the bond strength uh, to the uh, dental surface. So that's something I got to look at when it gets published. And um, I don't think it needs ver verification. I res highly respect Dr. Uh, Pascal, and I take that for the uh, to be the truth. So that might be something we might want to look at if you have a lot of dentin exposed to heat the uh, bonding agent. Plier. How would you, um, Richard, how would you heat it? Say that again? How would you heat the bonding agent? Uh, it you could be it. There's, there's several units. There's a CalSET unit that's very available from Aident. Uh, there are some other units. He's, I think, the first one first one that came out with that. You have the different compules you could put in the uh, heater uh, with that. Uh, Dr. Josh Freeman, who started Demetron many years ago, came out with that particular thing, has different trays. And actually, Pascal Magne, Magne uh, there's a, I think Jeff Rucher came out with the technique where there's a tray that he designed for uh, Dr. Freeman that you could put in the calcet heater that you actually use conventional composite, not the uh, cement that we normally use and they use heated composite to cement the veneers. It makes the veneer, uh, not the veneer, it makes the composite more flowable so you can totally seat the veneer and makes cleanup a lot easier and it's a lot stronger. So that's something uh, I'd like to see more research on that. Um, you know, we've been doing veneers with the conventional cements. So they seem to hold up, but uh, again, that might bring it to a higher level. You always want to do the best uh, technique at all possible for the patient. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier because it's like you were at uh, cement. And actually, I think it's the uh, uh, composite mycerium that he found that gets the best shade and the best flow uh, with the material. So it's uh, something you might want to look at. Mm, very interesting. Okay, that's what I'm saying. The one thing, I get in trouble by reading a lot, Sometimes you realize how much you don't know. The more you read, you see, you know, like some people I attend a lecture, they say, you know this stuff. 
And that's not true. I always pick up a lot of interesting material. And this I got also from uh, Dr. Goldstein's book. I scanned in some of the uh, preparations. Uh, I like doing, I'll show you the preparation we like prefer, but there are some people uh, who don't prepare the teeth at all. I think most lab technicians like a minimal prep at least uh, with that. But this is the, just shows you the demonstration of a no preparation veneer. And the gingival margin, I think, might be over contoured. But now, with some of the techniques, to be honest with you, one of the chapters was on the ink loop technique by uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Ivan uh, Ronaldo. Uh, and he uses, he gets the veneer down to 0.3 millimeters uh, with doing that with his particular technique. And he has videos online. Uh, and I believe he's lecturing in Europe also. It's called the ink glue technique uh, with uh, doing that down to 0.3 millimeters. That's with a uh, uh, lithium disilicate material. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then you have a window prep. Uh, you're, you're just going up to this point over here and then the edge preparation. Some people believe in that. Again, there might be a call for that. I haven't done those. I don't know if any participants have experience with these, but with a younger patient, you don't want to prep it and you stay away from the size of the ledge, but usually a lot of times you're changing the inside of the ledge. So you're going up over that. Uh, then you have the preparations such as over here, bevel and overlapping. Uh, the overlapping, I'll show you why it, Sometimes it could be problematic with that when I go over so many different uh, diagrams uh, with the uh, material. But the preparation that we usually prefer to do is basically a butt joint, gives you a definite seat, and if you're changing the incisal edge or color, uh, gives the laboratory uh, more freedom that they can develop that. Sometimes, unfortunately, a tooth is broken down quite a bit, and you can do a, uh, a full veneer. We can even do it's like a Taco Bell that goes covers the buccal lingual. I know some people in Europe do a, a combination technique. Uh, I think it's uh, Francesca Bellate in uh, International Dur Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry discussed that with the uh, one dentition that they do composite on the lingual and uh, porcelain on the labial. I haven't done that, but these are all different aspects, different reasons why you might do that. And again, you have to look at the occlusion and the individual case and talk to laboratory before you pick up a handpiece and decide the best technique and best material. This is for a uh, lower veneer, the type of preparation that uh, you would do with that. Uh, again, it's about a one millimeter reduction and about 0.5 on the labial, and you want to round this particular area, always have to round all your edges, no sharp line angles. Okay, uh, if we have time later, I guess see how it goes. I'm gonna go over step-by-step step, uh, making uh, Maria, who is one of our fellows, uh, who I mentioned before, uh, did a whole step-by-step -step series of slides on fabricating of the different uh, putty matrices uh, and how to do this. But you want to the idea we do something like this and whether you call it a mock-up or a provisional prototype that uh, uh, is used, Dr. McLaren calls it a provisional prototype, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, but you want to use a bits of krill material <coughs> Uh, put that in the mock-up and then insert it in the patient's mouth. And with these cut-ups, and that's a midline over here, so you got proper seating, and you could, the patient could, wow, and they see, they look at it, wow, that's really great. When can we stop doing it, you know? So they get an idea of what could be doing, uh, what could be done for their teeth uh, before you even start. And as I mentioned before, if you do it with a uh, a AI computer or something like that to develop something like this or a wax up. But again, at this point, patient can look at it and you could modify it. You could add some flowable or regular composite and reshape the incisal edge. Uh, you want to look at the smile line, how much shows and everything and modify it. Make it a little shorter, make it a little bit longer, change the embrasures and then take pictures and you could duplicate uh, that model before you start. So it gives you the laboratory and yourself an idea 
what the patient wants and what can be achieved. So you want to have adequate sizal reduction. Usually it's about a millimeter. It might be more, but ideally a millimeter would be a minimal amount uh, you want with that. And you can see with the guide, you can see the adequate reduction was done here. We'll go into that in more detail. This would be the ideal preparations. However, not every tooth is ideal. Uh, they might be rotated, they might be uh, chipped or broken. Again, this would be the ideal uh, preparation, wrapping around, and I usually I don't break the contact, other people do. There's reasons why you would break the contact, and we'll get into that shortly. So we showed you the incisal reduction. Also, you want to see the amount of labial reduction that's been. So you make these cutouts that you can pull the putty matrix back and you can see that adequate reduction was uh, done on the uh, teeth. Years ago, when I first started doing veneers, that's in prehistoric times, uh, we didn't do any of these. Uh, we just had depth cutters and whatever position the tooth was, we just went in 0 0.5, 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters uh, uh, with that and reducing the teeth. But now this is more controlled, so you're minimizing the amount of tooth structure that can be removed. And ideally, you want to remove the tooth structure in three planes. So you have your pre evaluate the APT, the Aesthetic pre value of Temporaries, and that's from Gallo-Corell's book that I recommend you uh, purchase uh, as a basic you know, his book, Pascal Magni, and some of the pictures I showed you at the beginning for Dr. Levine's book from the Aesthetic Rosenthal Aesthetic Program. Dr. Goldstein's uh, new two-volume book is another great book. You know, these are on different books and uh, with that. But sometimes you want to build the tooth up rather than cut it down. If I just cut into that, I'm removing more tooth structure. I might be removing the enamel. Sometimes the tooth might be retroclined or back, I might add composite to it, build it up. So when I depth cut through that, I'm not cutting enamel at all. Here I'm cutting into enamel, maybe more than I would like to. So you analyze your buckle reduction. These are the different guides you want to make up. So the depth cut up can only penetrate uh, until the non-cutting shaft is just flush with the tooth. So you want, again, three angulations. You have the gingival, middle, and size of one-thirds. Keep moving that. Okay, now if you have the uh, APT on there, you're gonna cut through that, and you can mark in pencil uh, with red, or whatever color you want, uh, where the grooves were cut. And then you use a, uh, another diamond, a modified chamfer finishing line. Usually I get, might be 0.5 to 0.3. Ideally at the gingival margin, I like to keep it less if possible, uh, 0.3 uh, millimeters, because there's less enamel at the gingival uh, area. And you get a better bond if you have enamel. Otherwise, it looks good initially, but you can start to pick up uh, stain if you're not on enamel. You know, it's a possibility. And the patient has to be aware of that. Okay, again, three different angles. Okay, you smooth off all the grooves so everything's all smooth. And you can see the amount of reduction. You wanna have adequate reduction. And what are the points you have to be aware of? I find with our students, a lot of times the embrasures is where you run the problem. You reduce enough on the labial, but here at the incisal, at the embrasure, it's not enough. You have to go into that and reduce that embrasure to get adequate space. And that's a very common problem. And the lab can't make the veneer properly where they make it up and then you have to reshape it. You're thinning out the veneer and probably uh, destroying the veneer. Uh, I know Brassler makes a two grit diamond. I don't know if other companies do. I think they still do. The advantage of the two grit is the uh, grit at the uh, at the apical uh, portion, doesn't cut as aggressively, so you're not going to reduce the uh, enamel as aggressively, so you want to stay, ideally, if you can, about 0.3 millimeters or so. And that's the uh, preparation. You want to end up with something like that. Okay? 
Now, in preparing the teeth, what you have to be careful of is create a dog leg into the gingival proximal uh, extension into the contact area. It's a very common uh, problem. The first time I did veneer, I prepped it, and they get the veneer back, and the patient turns a little bit sideways, and if they have a discolored dentition, they go, uh-oh, you see the dark discoloration underneath. You have to go enough into proximally so when the patient rotates their head, not looking straight on, that you don't see that uh, area at all. It should be hidden by your veneer. Very important. So it depends. It could be shallow, medium, or deep, the amount of pre preparation to contact the area. This is the interproximal margin. I usually stay short of the contact area, but I'll show you why you might have, want to break the contact. Now, sometimes the contact should be sliced from the facial to the palatal, but why would you do that? If there's a diastema, that's what you would do. If you want to move the midline over and change the position of the tooth, you have to do that also. So you want to come straight through. But what happens, I found some of the students, and unfortunately, lab sends it back to have it uh, reprepped, or sometimes they make the veneer, is that it slice comes through toward the palate and creates an undercut over here. So you want to come straight through like that so the path of insertion doesn't create an undercut that you end up with an open margin where the veneer doesn't seat completely. So again, for diastema and for moving the teeth. And also if you do something like this, you want to take the margin somewhat subgingively, maybe half a millimeter or so subgingively so you got a proper emergence profile uh, this is very common for a peg-shaped uh, tooth, that you have to do something like this. It's not a lot of reshaping, but it's very critical. First time I had a peg shape, but tooth, I got it back, and I had to end up having to reprep it. So you learn, hopefully you learn from your mistakes. I don't do that again. And you take a diamond strip to lighten the contact uh, a little bit with an S-shape like this, and you just pull that through. It was an article by David Garber demonstrating that. He said also, if the lab makes a die, it allows them to see where the margins isn't separated. So you just pull that through with an S-shape, with a diamond strip. And sometimes the preparation, as I said, can be short, medium, or long wrapping. That's from Pascal Manier. Ideally, you want your preparation, uh, the margin shouldn't be at a contact area. So you want to keep away from the uh, concavity. But sometimes the tooth is broken down. It might be a problem. I would want to go past that uh, area in preparing the tooth if that was the uh, case. So you want to not have that particular finish line there. You don't have the contact at the junction between, between tooth structure and the porcelain veneer. And if you have a composite, I usually would prefer to eliminate the composite uh, and have everything all in porcelain. However, sometimes uh, I might do that because I don't want to destroy more tooth structure. And if there's an old composite, I take it out and replace and put a uh, fresh composite in there. And other people might have different uh, concepts on that and feel differently about doing that. Now, if their teeth are crowded, we mentioned with uh, making these indices, but when you do it, the index is made from the wax up. If the index doesn't seat, you can't use that to make your provisional prototype. You have to recon to remove the parts that are protruding first. So you want to eliminate. See, the, this is going to have to be built up with composite to get an alignment with this area reduced. Okay, so it's going to be built up with composite filled in with composite, and built up to get a nice curvature of your arch. And the preparation through the uh, APT with the depth cutters, right? So you're minimizing the amount of uh, tooth structure that you're moving for the porcelain veneer. So now I'm able to seat my uh, index into position, exact facial thickness of the APT. In producing my porcelain veneers, I want to 
not have any sharp angles and ideally I shouldn't be thinner than 0.3 millimeters the uh, veneer and it should I think most lab technicians, lab technicians like one millimeter thick on the incisal edge and ideally you want a proper emergence profile so I like to do a minimal prep on the uh, veneer even it could be a finish line at least you have an idea lab has an idea where to finish their margins appropriately again other people might have different concepts and philosophies on that if you keep it very thin it's probably not that critical if you're making a thicker veneer and you don't prepare it i think it's problematic for the uh, soft tissue so again, to reiterate, I mentioned concealing the interprosomal porcelain margin. And sometimes to get a better bond and greater strength, you might want to wrap it around more. If there's less enamel, you want to grab as much enamel as possible. So this could be a problematic. You don't want to have a sharp line and go right at this point. That could stress point and the veneer might fracture. Also, if you don't reduce the tooth enough, you're gonna build out the labial contour too much and it's be over contoured. So you wanna have adequate reduction in the laboratory. This would be an ideal preparation. Again, depends on the position of the tooth where it's 0.5 millimeters. That's why the guides give you a better idea of how much reduction you actually need. You go 0.3 over here. And for the dark tooth, you might go to 0.8. Uh, the incisal edge, again, I mentioned, about one millimeter. And this is what the two should look like after proper reduction. I try to keep the prep, as I mentioned before, away from the finish line, because that might be problematic with chipping and uh, breaking at that point. So you keep that away from that area. So if you do a lingual overlap that I alluded to earlier with something like this, and if you make it 0.5 millimeters can be over contoured in the uh, lingual. You end up reducing that, you end up with 0.2 millimeters and it might weaken that area and it might subsequently fracture. And you also might end up with a thin sliver of tooth structure and that might be problematic, that might break. So I would want to reduce that. And sometimes you have to go to full coverage or as I mentioned, the Taco Bell type of uh, preparation. So you're reducing that and wrapping around from the uh, labial to the lingual, but not going through the interproximal. And it depends on the laboratory that you're working with. Uh, again, I try to remove all the composite if possible. But one of the problems with, uh, you could have a class for a composite and you might have done that you know, recently and could say I could just prep through that. Uh, the thing with the uh, laboratory, they have to be able to opaque that area or block it out. And basically, when you prep the tooth, the shade of the uh, porcelain at that point will be the same shade of the uh, prep tooth and then you put a final enamel layer on that'll blend everything in and it takes a very skilled lab technician to avoid that demarcation otherwise you see the dark shine through from the posterior of the mouth so again it depends on your lab technician's capability if you're doing a uh, posterior tooth uh, the maxillary arch I want to reduce the uh, I'm going to go about halfway down the uh, buccal cusp, about one millimeter reduction and about 0.5 on the labial, and then up with a preparation such as this. On the lower, it's a little bit different, be 0.5 on the labial again. And here I'm going to go to the central fossa, and that's uh, might go one or 1.5, depending on the material, whether it's uh, lithium disilicate or it's going to be porcelain. Uh, I probably would go with lithium disilicate, but again, that uh, depends on the occlusion of the uh, patient. But you have to analyze that so you're preparing the tooth adequately for the uh, laboratory. And again, the more look at the shade of the tooth that you're starting with, how much do you want to change your shade? If you're starting with a C4 and the patient wants to go to B1 or a bleach shade, uh, you might have to reduce the tooth quite a bit, all right, uh, with that. Otherwise, sometimes very opaquing mediums might be required, but it might make the tooth look dead and not as lifelike, very opaque, and might not look 
uh, and it's not it's an adequate perception, but again, you can be indented and is more problematic with uh, debonding of the uh, veneer. So patient has to be aware of it and he has to see, sometimes you have to go to full coverage and whether you use zirconia or some of the other new materials of combination, zirconia and uh, uh, lithium disilicate, uh, zirconia and uh, feldspathic porcelain or some of the new materials that Vita just came out with, enamic and so forth. A lot of different materials and unfortunately we don't have a lot of guidelines of which material would be best in all situations. So we want to avoid that sharp angle beside the uh, stress at that area. Light doesn't diffuse as well into that area at that deep, sharp demarcation. So you want to round the incisor ledge. So if you prepare it, look at all your line angles that they will round it. And we went over this before, the different type of preparations where it's a window, a feather edge, a bevel, or incisor overlap uh, of material. Again, uh, transparent materials allow light to pass through. Translucent bodies allow light to pass through, but they also scatter the light uh, with the material. It makes it look more realistic, actually, with uh, translucent materials. And opaque, don't let light through, and sometimes they look dead. They might block off the dark tooth underneath, but they just don't look as well as they should, and you disappoint the patients. Moving along pretty good, I think. Now what I'd like to do is uh, demonstrate, uh, again, this is thanks to some of our talented students we've had over the several years. Uh, this case one is by uh, Maria, and we presented this, uh, she did this at the uh, Greater New York Dental Meeting and you know, at the uh, school. And here the patient had, uh, you could look at the patient and the shape of the teeth, discoloration of the teeth, and she wanted to contour the teeth. Here you could analyze, you know, parallel to the lip. And as I mentioned before, asymmetry of the lip. Look at the way the lip is here and look at the lip the way it is over here. I'm, as I'm looking at this, before you study this, you realize things that you never uh, think is. You gotta tell the patient, you know, that this is uh, the situation. And sometimes when you put the teeth in though, it might change the drape of the lip too. That's why the provisionals, uh, are very important to assess. Sometimes you do the provisionals and you let you don't take your final impression and let the patient come back. My, it means re-anesthetizing the patient again, but you can pick up so many different, uh, you know, situations. You know, close up in occlusion. And you can see the spacing on the lower anteriors. You have different problems here. You have spacing on the lower anteriors and here. There's uh, actually, see I'm looking at it more, assessing that there might be some composite here. One of the things you don't want is a cant here. See it's slanted, <laughs> if the midline is straight, and I'll show you later, people don't notice that. If it's canted, either you gotta walk with your head tilted over so people don't notice that, or you gotta get that fixed. And also, you see the papilla, all right? Look where the papilla is here, look where the papilla is here. So there's probably, you know, I don't have the x-rays, but where's the bone over here? So these are things you want to analyze before you start prepping the teeth. Occlusal view, and you can see the wear on the incisal edge. That's, you have to look at the occlusal function. This was a unfortunate patient, didn't have a lot of money, and she wanted to prove the aesthetics, so it was limited. She was having some implants in the posterior, but, uh, wasn't totally complete. I did we do everything all well, implant support in the post area. And one of the other things is because I learned that uh, when errors, sometimes if you don't have a posterior occlusion, good posterior occlusion, you do veneers, they end up keep breaking and it's gonna haunt you forever. Again, close up teeth. And this is the uh, aesthetic prototype the patient could appreciate what the potential could be if she had the veneers done. And this particular case besides showing uh, the problem, it's gonna show step by step with insertion of the veneer and prepping. So here again, through the APT reduction, size alleged and labial reduction, smoothing that off and connecting. And then the final preparations you could see over here proper 
space for the incisal ledge. And here she brought it straight through to the lingual. She's probably moving the midline over a little bit with uh, doing that. All right, this is a tricky preparation when they're like this and parallelly involved uh, with doing that with the path of insertion. Again, a close up of the preparations. And then putting the provisionals back after they were prepared. So you could see the midline now is not canted. And even the papilla is filling that area in a little bit. All right, so it looks much better. But again, you analyze that before, incisal embrasures, you wanna look at gingival, and also uh, if you're getting involved with the bulk of corridor, which we'll mention uh, later. This tooth I would have liked to brought in more. I think she had, I forgot what she had over there again. Uh, this was done several years ago, all right? But you can see the inclusion, the provisionals. Incisal edge, literally. And then cementation technique. This is the veneers on the model. The veneers came back from the laboratory. These are feldspathic, I believe. And then you could try a try and paste. Usually I try to use a, uh, a see, very linked. It depends on the different cements that you use. Very linked. They modify with the newer cements. Uh, they change it because you can make it either warmer or less. So you're changing the value, which is usually not gonna change the shape, but you might up the value a little bit depending on the thickness of the veneer. Usually I try to get the shade uh, with the veneer itself, not with the cement. I use a translucent material, a clear. And you know, the veneers can uh, try in and what they look like. And uh, this is the arm material. This consepsis scrub is from, uh, Ultradent and the uh, traction cord and etching material. This is the bees material. It could be, uh, this material could be used uh, either toe etch, uh, minimal etch, and so forth. We're not gonna get into the etching technique and the varying cements. We mentioned warm, uh, more a whitish, lightish color and the translucent uh, shades that you could use. You're gonna clean, well, I'm gonna go over steps. I have a clean. Uh, to clean out the veneer, you can use phosphoric acid if you have uh, zirconia. This is, the, you shouldn't use phosphoric gas, you use IvoClean to clean it out. And uh, Bisco came out with a similar material recently, I haven't seen the research on that. And the Motorbahn uh, Plus that has uh, MDP in it uh, also. What's in the um, IvoClean? Which one? What's in the IvoClean? You know, you mentioned on the slide before. What's in, what does it contain? Well, I have a whole series of slides of that beyond the presentation, but it's, it cleans out the uh, like saliva contamination, the phosphate okay. from the area. I have a series of slides on that. I can always send people if they want with that. But something like this is more efficacious. Uh, well, if you're doing a veneer, I think just using phosphoric acid probably will clean it out fine. But if you uh, want to clean out contamination from uh, zirconia, this is what you want to use as a new uh, one from uh, Abisco, all mm -hmm. right? Because uh, the phosphoric acid contaminates uh, zirconia, all right? But this uh, eliminates the saliva phosphate com com uh, contamination, combines mm -hmm. with it, and then you rinse it out. Okay. Great. And you're cleaning it with consepsis uh, scrub. Uh, then with the bonding with that, anything with uh, chlorhexidine, supposedly might cut down or eliminate MMPs, which is metal proteinases that might interfere with long-term bonding. So this is available from uh, Ultradent to clean the tooth prior to that. Another thing you might want to uh, look into doing something, I know Pascamania uh, uses uh, uh, 50 micron or maybe uh, 25 micron aluminum oxide to sandblast the surface of the tooth. Uh, I clean it off and you might get a somewhat better bond uh, with that, but basically to clean off the surface, it's a good way to clean off any contamination with uh, something you might want to look into. Uh, packing cord, proper isolation, uh, etching. Again, if you're on enamel, uh, totally depends whether you do a total etch technique, 
and depending on which bonding agent we use, again, that's beyond this presentation. Uh, this is the Ivo coin in the tooth, or well, not in the tooth, in the veneer, cleaning it out, and you do a little scrubbing action, and then you rinse that out, uh, air dry it. And put, you could put silane in the MDP, uh, you could put into the uh, veneer at that point, all right, and let it air dry. Okay. Put bonding agent on your tooth. You put, I don't put bonding agent on uh, ven uh, inside veneer. Some people do. I might start doing that, but you don't like your, the bonding agent in the uh, veneer. Uh, some people, most people, I think, uh, put the bonding agent on and uh, like your, but you have to make sure that the bonding agent, the film thickness is minimal. Uh, if it's a fill bonding agent like OptiBond, it could be very thick. So you wanna make sure you thin that out properly. Otherwise your veneer is not gonna seed appropriately. Okay. And insert the veneer, clean the excess off with uh, floss. So you might use your micro brush to clean off some of the uh, excess uh, material before you like your, you might tack your it for maybe three seconds just to have it gel and you can clean it up more readily. Okay, and you notice in the previous slides, there's Teflon tape here preventing etching from the adjacent tooth. Okay, and as an opti isolation with a rubber dam or is optic uh, dam from uh, Ivoclar would be good for isolation too. Mm -hmm. Those things you want to think about before you get started, you know, cleaning off the extra. Again, doing the same thing on the adjacent teeth. Now, when you bond, I usually do the two central first. Some people do all at one time. They place them, they tack them in position, clean off the excess. Uh, I did that with some of the students uh, about twice in school, but most of the time we do the two centrals first and then the central and the lateral next. Sometimes you have to want to try the veneer in again. Uh, because sometimes with the seating, it might be not be exactly the same as the try-in and make sure you veneer the heat properly. Uh, again, the Teflon tape and checking the contact that might be in the way and it's binding the air, so you have to reduce that with a fine diamond. Etching again, bonding agent, placing the cement and veneer, put a thin layer and then push that into position and you want to Ideally, you're coming, if it's uh, like the preparation I mentioned, coming from the sizal down. And when you tack it, you wanna make sure you're holding in position at the gingival area. And sometimes I might hold in the sizal edge in the gingival area and have my assistant tack it in the middle over here, just to hold it in position. Okay, insertion of the veneers. Please don't go back. No. Okay. Tissue might come down, you know, that's right after placement uh, without the patient, but wearing the provisionals for a while, sometimes also depending on where the bone is. Uh, looking at where the contact is and where the bone is, according to time now, you want about five millimeters from there. Otherwise you have to play with the contact. We have to tell the patient that's not gonna fill in. Uh, but you have to give it time. Sometimes it takes a couple of months for that to fill in or this usually will come down. Uh, it might be just from the cord retraction that's pushing that up. Uh, Richard, we've got a question from another Richard. Yeah. And he said, if you're etching the ceramic, not zirconia, yourself with hydrofluoric uh, acid after trying, is there any additional benefit to either clean or is this only if you are asking your lab uh, to etch with hydrofluoric acid? before they send the, the restorations? No, if you, yeah, if you etch, if you were your lab etches with hydrofluoric acid before you try it in, if you try, if you, if it comes back from the lab etch and you try it in, you're contaminating it with saliva. So you either want to use phosphoric acid or the ivoquine to clean it out. Uh, Richard Field, any questions? Okay. To come back on that? Um, and then, and, and Claudia, yeah, Paula says always clean it afterwards, yeah, okay. Yeah, rinse it out. But again, it's very important if you're trying in, it's beyond this lecture, but 
when I was talking about uh, zirconia, very important if you etch, if you use phosphoric acid on zirconia, it actually contaminates the surface. And if you want to bond it in, it's going to be problematic. You have to clean that out with sandblasting or other techniques of mm. uh, doing that. So, so um, Richard asked one more question. If you yep. are etching yourself through um, with hydrofluoric acid after you try in, do you still need Ivoclean? If you do the etch without no, you could just silent. You could just silenate it. Just silenate. Yeah, just silenate. Okay. okay yeah, great. just to clean out any contamination. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the follow-up. That's the case that uh, she did the very nice uh, maxillary arch and the mandibular. I don't think she did the mandible. It's very nice, but you're limited with what the patient was able to afford at that time. But she's mm -hmm. very you know what you started with and what you end up with, and that's the end result. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. the lowers don't complement the max lay, but hopefully she'll come back and do that in the future, depending on, again, you know, it's all finances and what shows when she smiles, but they were excellent results. And the lab work was done by Peter Pizzi. I know he's lectured in London uh, several times. He's a, uh, there's some excellent technicians throughout the world. He's one of them. Uh, with that, he's lectured all the major meetings. So uh, uh, it's so a pleasure nice working. Line angles on the on the porcelain. Very nice line angles. Mm -hmm. Very neat. Nice, a nice result. Yeah. Now all the cases uh, he did it that I'm going to be showing all cases that Peter did. And case two, this is uh, by Bobna. Uh, again, this shows proportions of teeth spacing. Uh, here we have several different uh, problems with that. So, you know, again, a lot of times people in the United States, I don't know, in uh, England, in the United States, a lot of times people tend to do full coverage too often. A lot of times veneers, uh, partial coverage work out quite well if you know how to bond properly and uh, get the occlusion uh, correct, whether you use a different analyzers to evaluate the occlusion. But here you look at close up, you have uh, a space problem. All right, uh, on the top, on the maxillary and the mandibular arches. And also you had that large composite placed on number, uh, that'd be one, one uh, or nine that uh, you have to take in consideration. So the midline's off on this also uh, with doing that. And if you want to get proper proportions, you want to use the, maybe the Bolton analysis to uh, figure out the proper size of the teeth, but also, uh, with the lab work, we could do it digitally to uh, design the case before you get started. Uh, There's a occlusal view of the uh, patient. These are all the different views that you should be taking, and we'll go into more, a little more detail in a little bit with some of the other cases. All right, again, uh, prepping that, you wanna make sure you have uh, adequate preparation here. More reduction is needed, same thing you see over here. Very important that these uh, junctions. Putting in the uh, uh, prototype and see what it looks like on the max and mandibular. See the spaces are closed. Uh, midline looks like it's aligned pretty good. Uh, Pill looks. This is what you should look at. I'm looking at it again, reassessing. Papilla looks nice. All the different papilla on uh, size embrasures. Some people like it straight across. I don't recommend it to the patients, but some people have very deep embrasures. They want that minimized. So you can uh, readjust those at this point. Uh, prepping the teeth again, we did the labial reduction. Blending. Again, and the final preparations, packing cord. Provisionals back in position and the cementation. Uh, excellent, same lab technician, excellent. Look at the anatomy on this too. Uh, you know, it's not just the line angles, but breaking up the lights, it doesn't, you know, you gotta see how the light reflects back at you, sometimes using a, uh, I forgot what you call it, the uh, different lenses, the, uh, I'll think of it in a little bit. Um, Infection. No, that's the uh, 
No, they have it where it eliminates the, it's like uh, when you wear sunglasses, they have special glasses. The, polarization. Uh, polarized yeah, polarized, that polarized mm -hmm. lenses, right. You got mm -hmm. it. Thank you. I get a senior moment once in a while. All right. But that, you know, because you want to look at a lot of different things uh, at this particular point. Because sometimes it could be the color could be right on the line angles, could be wrong, or the way it breaks up light or either reflects or diffracts light, makes it look different and doesn't look good to the patients. These are little nuances that uh, some patients really pick up on it. And you gotta be careful with that. You need an excellent lab technician. And the final aesthetic result, again, uh, here achieved. Close up and the mandible. Very nice. Okay, case three. This is by Bhavna also. We'll move along perfectly on time. All right? I didn't know how it worked out. It was good. Uh, sorry, I didn't put even more slides in this. I'd like to possibly publish that. It's the unfortunate patient. See, here in school, it's good. Sometimes you have one of the students helping the other students. You have somebody with a camera, and they're all trained on the cameras right at the beginning, which that's going to be, I don't know how we're going to do that once we go back to school. Some of these pictures might be problematic, to be honest with you. Mm. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Yeah. Let's be positive. All it's right? difficult with the visors and with, the, with your visors and your loops and everything to see through the camera. And so you land up having to take the visors off and the, and the loops and all that. And you land up not socially distancing with the patient because you need to get a good photo. I got to have the patient take pictures of themselves or their significant other take pictures yeah. of them. You got to come in with your own pictures, that's all. Yeah. All right. But this is uh, the different views that we take, the smile view, retracted view. Uh, this is the Duchesne smile. That's we, because sometimes a lot of people smile and they go, yeah, that, and then they put the veneers in. They like to think, oh, they have a low smile on you, put the veneers in, or they show a lot of uh, pink, uh, pink tissue. You go, uh oh. Uh, so you want to get as maximum. You still, even with the Shane smile, it doesn't smile that broadly. But uh, you can see, see, here's more problems, though. So you want to look at the upper lip is thin, tooth exposure is only one millimeter. As we get older, myself included, you know, you get show more the mandible, all right? And the lower lip is uh, fuller than the uh, maxillary uh, lip here. And you look at the work by uh, Bing and Brindo uh, with that. And we take more pictures that I'm showing here. And uh, Dr. Sivan Finkel showed your step-by-step -step pictures in the book with the other books that have uh, similar type of thing, but you want to look at the profile view, but it's concave. Uh, he has a concave and a rickets. That's the uh, relationship of the uh, maxillary lip, the upper lip to the this line over here and the lower lip to that line and the uh, angle over here. Because sometimes you might want to suggest orthodontics to correct some of these prior to that. They might need orthodontic surgery. So you got to be aware of what you can do prosthetically and what would be better orthodontically or even orthodontic surgery. Patients that I don't want it, I can't afford it, whatever reason, they have to be aware of the limitations. All right. And this is from the uh, coachman uh, technique. You want to take a 12 o'clock view also. So what we do in school, and then we should I recommend it also. First, you look at the facial analysis, and then you go into the dentofacial analysis. So you want to look at the upper lip smile line. It's average. The uh, relationship to the lower lip, it's actually reversed. It's not touching. And whether you think about the buccal corridor, how many teeth are shown here? He's displaying 12 teeth. So like if you only do four or six teeth, is that going to take care of the problem? You know, maybe, maybe not. Depends on the smile and what the patient wants, but you have to make aware of the possibilities. Sometimes you might do a wax up with a digital design going all the way back and you do the provisional prototype and the patient says, I don't want to go that back. You can actually cut off some of the uh, bisacryl that's on the teeth, even one at a time and show the pe uh, patient the possibilities. All right. And the upper lip again, lower lip size of lash and the number of teeth displayed. 
And you gotta look at the midline. Is it centered? Yeah, look compared to the filtrum. Left to center, here your body lever, bad lateral negative space is increased, especially on this side over here. You have a shadow back here. So this is what you wanna do. And you wanna take a 45 degree, look. I don't see many articles, if at all, that show this uh, angle. And a lot of times we're talking to people, that's the view that we see when we're talking about staying next to them, we're not right in front of them. This is very often the view that we see of the patient. So I would suggest a 45 degree mm -hmm. angle view. Okay, then we do dental analysis. Tooth proportion, 80%. percent we'll go back a second. Okay, so you might want to go up or you're going to go down with this particular patient. All right, complete occlusion has a deep overbite. Sizal edge is reversed. Zenith position, uh, a bit. Okay, the axial inclination of the teeth and the embrasures on contacts. So you could see. Due to wear on the two centrals, there's almost no embrasure between uh, one one and one two or eight and nine. And this is good. This is why I really like the publishers. A lot of uh, things about it's beyond what we could do in here, but you can do tabletop, which are like basically occlusal veneers or onlay veneers and restoring vertical dimensions. Sometimes you don't have to do full coverage on these. Sometimes you do tabletops. Do a couple of great articles uh, in the QDT uh, journal and other journals. I know Dr. Calamita did, a, Calamita did a great article on that. So you do the wax up and you have the lab make a uh, stent and put bisacryl in there and you can bond clusal tabletops for the patient. If the patient can't afford to replace you with porcelain right away, you could have the lab uh, make composite mm -hmm. tabletops where you could do it directly in the patient's mouth, make a mm -hmm. clear matrix. Again, that's beyond what we're gonna discuss here. But the mm -hmm. idea is conservative dentistry, I could restore and get the vertical at the position that I want that I could restore the teeth properly. Because to this particular patient, Either you have to do it orthodontically or you're doing it prosthetically to get the uh, vertical at the position that you want. All right. These are the teeth prepared. Because here we're going through, because you have a diastema. So you go straight through, right? Right to the lingual, straight to the lingual. And at this point, you want to take it slightly subgingerly so you got a nice convergence profile over here. All right. And sometimes when you get the veneers back, you gotta be careful. If they don't go into position, uh, you try it on the model. Uh, if the lab tells you rather than have you reprep the tooth, they can make a reduction coping. So you prep that in the patient's mouth. They have the veneers that were made, fabric and label, it's gonna reduce it, but you don't have to reprep the teeth. Mm before the impression. Uh, Cause actually I learned about that. I had a case that I redid some old crowns and I thought I, I just had to reprep the teeth and get better gingival margins. I didn't realize the uh, number eight was out too far labially. I got it back from the lab and I could see the uh, model showing through. And he said, you know, try it in. I tried it in with the water and with a try and paste. It didn't look bad. I ended up bonding it. And then the two structures showed through. If they would have done a reduction coping, I could have reduced that and put the proper veneer in. So mm -hmm. I learned what not to do in that position. It's and very helpful to have the reduction coping. What's that? It's With very the... helpful to have that. Yeah. Definitely, it's mm -hmm. something you, your lab should uh, do. Uh, because sometimes you could send it, the lab could send it back and tell you to reprep it. Somebody, it's inconvenient to reprep. Uh, the tooth, you have to take off the temps, re anesthetize the patient. And if you anesthetize the patient, do at final seating, that would be ideal. Mm. Okay, so that's the advantage of that. That's the veneers on the model. 
the restorations on the model. So you start from a wax up, it's not digitally done. This is again by PZ Laboratory. The veneers on the model. And you can see, look at the discoloration on the teeth. All right. So yeah. what cement would you use to block that out? Again, ideally, they did it, I believe, just with the veneers itself. In the chapter that I wrote on, because the one of the cases, I, I, my, ch my chapter in the book was on discolored teeth. There are techniques, there's a stratification, stratification technique that Pascal Magne wrote an article on that talks about how to block that out with the uh, porcelain. Otherwise, you're going to have to use a more opaque cement. Mm. The other thing you can do is prep this area and actually place composite in there uh, to lighten it also, but you have less control over it. Uh, that's what I'm saying, before you get started discussing it with the lab, and you really need a very skilled lab technician, because I did veneers years ago before they had some of the great materials they have now. It looked much better, but the, the teeth look very you know, opaque. Mm. Okay. So it's uh, tricky with doing that, but the thing is, uh, if people want a reference, I have it in the chapter, it's stratification technique by Pascal Magne, uh, talks about how you mask that out. His brother, Michel Magne, Magne is a uh, superb lab technician uh, with that, if you haven't seen his work. I saw him years ago at the Great New York Prostodontic meeting before he came to the States, and I saw his brother's provisionals, I woke. It just blew my mind you know, with some of the stuff that they were doing. Mm. Again, but something like this, the lab could do it, that would be the best thing. Uh, the other thing would be prepping the ginger darker areas and blending them, make it more uniform, the uh, shade. Otherwise you have to use an opaquing cement, which is not as ideal. All right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Veneers. And we said the cup out, hold on. There we go. See with this, see I probably would have uh, take this slightly sub gingerly over here to get a little better emergence profile with mm. that. It's a great case, but you know, look back sometimes, the minor things you would probably improve upon that. It would take in that slightly sub gingerly so I get better emergence profile here. That's being picky. Well, look at those beautiful veneers. Mm. Okay, before on the model. And unfortunately, due to COVID, she couldn't get final pictures of the patient. He sent pictures uh, of the case. Okay, we have one more case, but look at that great result I got. Very nice. Mm. You, you know, look paper. happy. Very, I like to publish on. See, you're talking about several things restoring vertical dimension, getting us, see, looking at occlusion, aesthetics, material selection, all the things you have to consider before you start the case. Mm. Very important. And working with your lab and not saying just do veneers. You know, you have to plan it out beforehand. And this is the, uh, let's see, I have, oh, I have two more cases. We'll finish on, uh, soon. Now this is a little bit different. Minimally invasive, this is Ash. She was our fellow, tooth exposure at rest. Again, young, this is a younger patient. She's probably in her 20s, maybe. Uh, upper lip average. I think it's pretty full. That's another thing I want to do a study on because a lot of these terminology, full average, nobody actually measured that. But uh, mandible, two millimeters. Size ledge to lower lip. Straight across, all right? And you have the spacing. You have a peg shape. What? tapered lateral here, here normal lateral. So you have several different problems. Now, mm. what would you do with a young patient like this? So years ago, I did something like this. If you want to do it veneers, it's minimally invasive. Otherwise, I could bond composite and do that with composite too. But facial midline relative to the dental midline, you see that's over, but it's not canted. Okay, the soft tissue symmetry, you want to bring here patient required a little gingivectomy. Do osseous sounding to make sure you have adequate room that you don't have to do osseous recontouring. 
again. The pillow. Height to width ratio. Axial inclination. Little surgery to crown lens to net. Here's the preparation. And here we're going to do window veneers or partial veneers. And this again, I haven't done any, I don't know if any of your participants or yourself have you done that, but shade selection. And these are the fragments. Mm. All right. So here we're doing a full veneer. It's a peg shaped lateral. You just have the minimal reshaping of that tooth. Mm. And then these are partial veneers. Wow. What material is that? It's feldspathic porcelain. Hmm. All right? Yeah. You know, some people cover the whole labial. It's something like this, you want to basically recontour the tooth so you get proper insertion uh, with that, but they're, you have to have good nerves. You put too much pressure on that, you go, uh -oh. You know, it's very thin. Mm. So she did a great job. I'll show you the result. That's before and after. Mm. Look at that. Very nice. All right. Can't get any more conservative than that. Mm. All right. So these are different things I want people to think about, not just prepping teeth. All right. Before and after. Before. After. Mm. And look at the tissue height. The papilla. Okay. Very nice. Okay, over here. This is a combination of implants and veneers. Uh, this is one of the cases, I don't know if I, you got, I send it to you later on. I was publishing Compendium. I don't know if you had a chance to send that out to people. I mean, I've got it on our study group WhatsApp. If anybody wants to just to join the WhatsApp group, just message me. Linda, yeah. I'll, also, yeah. I'll send it out when I do the certificates. When the do the CPD, that's great. Well. Thanks, Di. Because what's interesting about this, we're not going to get into uh, with implants, is when you use pink porcelain and when you do grafting. Here they did a combination of grafting. It wasn't adequate. I won't go into history of why she lost it, but you have a labial defect here. All right that needs to be built out. The uh, horizontally, it's a lot easier to build out. Vertical augmentation uh, is very hard. There's, I forgot his name. He used to be a Loma Linda. He just published a book on it. Uh, he gets phenomenal results with uh, vertical augmentation, but he's probably one of the few that can uh, do that type of work. All right, but, the, uh, but here you have combination. Veneers on these teeth and implant placement. A provisional, just to get an idea of the soft tissue, what it would look like. Mm -hmm. That's a provisional here and a provisional, these are provisional uh, veneer preps. And the final result. All right, so you mm -hmm. have veneer, veneer, implant, can't leave a lateral off, and it's hard enough matching the white, matching pink is very difficult also. Mm -hmm. Mm. Of course, you get a patient who's right, right leg rips look like that uh, distracts you from everything. All right. Uh, that's the end of, do we have a f uh, couple more minutes or? I'm sure we have two more minutes, yeah. Two more. Well, this is, let me just tell you that uh, this is, I'll just run through this quickly. Could get an idea of the matrices cutting midline. And this is the incisal edge reduction. And so it put in a pressure pot so it's uh, more accurate. Size so ledge reduction, buckle reduction, you make another one. So you need three sets of these. You need three, um, three stents. Three stents, right. Okay. And that's it. Brilliant. Any other questions or we're good? So now let's open to the participants. Um, any questions or if you want to, uh, if you want to unmute yourself to ask questions. Are we happy to take questions? Um, Ilan, okay, Ilan wants to join the WhatsApp group, Di. 
So um, we'll organize that for you. Um, can we talk about, um, so the Mary says, thank you very much, an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, can we talk about, just quickly, um, the different cements that you use for veneer cementation? Okay, for veneer cementation, as I showed you, that's a light cured uh, cement. Mm. All right. Uh, ideally, you want to light. What's up? A Viva Dent. Yeah, that was Viva Dent's material. It has different preferences. It could, it's a lot of good materials now. What I like about that, and there's some other ones that do that, uh, is it you change you could change the value a little bit because we had somebody at school, and I'm not a big thing with the try and paste because somebody they were inaccurate. But see, these are glue from paste and they wash out readily. But we had a a case in school that we tried it in, and it was. Uh, uh, the value was uh, was just too bright, and I and they were going to send it back to redo the uh, veneer. I said, "Let's try it with the uh, lower value paste," and they go, "Paste, oh, well, that looks pretty good." And they ended up bonding that in. So ninety five, ninety eight percent, I'm going to use a translucent. I rely on the lab to get the shade right, but if I want to change the value, make it a little bit brighter, because you want to go by the value. Uh, with that, I find I like the I like personal preference. I like value based cements. The other thing, as I mentioned before, a couple of people use the uh, uh, regular composite, and uh, he mentioned the mycerium composite. Mycerium, yeah. Can yeah. I ask you? There's a question from Dr. Kamlish. Um, he wants to know about emotional dentistry. You mentioned it. Emotional dentistry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, basically, that's. I alluded, I didn't go into the more detail, but actually I was showing that all the time. Because uh, with that is that after you discuss it with the patient, or sometimes rather than doing it uh, digitally before, I would even take composite, the flowable red composite, and try to get an idea from the patient, the length of the tooth and different things. I could do a quick mock-up in the patient's mouth. Uh, show them what it looks like, take pictures of it, and then I would have the lab where you could do it digitally with digital smile design. Uh, if you're good, skillful yourself, you could do it yourself. <clears throat> and uh, make a stent from the wax up with a digital design, and you use a bisacryl material and put that in the patient's mouth and it could see what it looks like. The problem is sometimes if the teeth are rotated out labial, you're not gonna be able to see the uh, mock-up totally in position. So it'll give you less of a ideal result with that. But as I showed you before, with some of the cases, you got a dramatic change with that, especially if you're closing uh, midline diastomas and so forth. Uh, midlines all of a sudden, boom, that looks great. Where they don't show the, uh, Incisal the edge when they smile, or so now they show the size of the edge when they smile. So, so you get so a, there's, there's a lot of questions now. Yeah. There's some quite a few questions, which we just take a quick few more. They want okay. to know um, when would you do ortho before veneers? If I have to prep the teeth a lot, uh, if I have to prep the teeth a lot and I'm going to be indented, and I definitely would re or recommend it. Sometimes you could do it if it's sometimes with somebody quicker procedure. If it's minor tooth movement, it might only take six months to be beneficial for the uh, patient. Because as as I'm prepping the teeth more, I, I'm not going to get as good a bond if I'm on dentin. I definitely recommend it if they absolutely refuse. You know, I would at least like them to go for ortho consult and see what would yeah. be involved with that. And again, in the chapter in the book, that's why I had them write it along that those terms why you would do ortho before the veneers. Next question. Um, how do we prevent bonding temps well to immediately sealed dentine? I know you prefer not to be in dentine, but sometimes it happens. Say that again. Bond um, how do you prevent uh, bonding temps well to immediately sealed dentine? Well, that's the problem with that. That's, I, didn't I didn't go into me then sealing is really you have to use a separating medium, otherwise you're gonna to bond to the uh, area. The temps, uh, yeah. there's, one, there's a material by uh, Bisco and separating medium that you can use for that, but that's a potential you know, problem that'll bond to it, yeah. One more question, this is the last question, about um, how do you try, and when you've got um, 
those partial veneers, um, isn't it difficult to use a try and paste for that? I don't see why you couldn't use a try and paste. Well, usually, because actually a try and paste is going to hold the veneer in position. Water might not be as good to hold it in position and get a better idea as a color. Again, you just have to be very careful rinsing it out, not to squeeze the veneer. Uh, it's like, you know, having empty egg and you have the shell and you squeeze it, you know, you can have a big problem. But okay, yeah, you great. can use a try and paste. Sure. Brilliant. Brilliant. So um, I'll, I'll say thank you so much, Richard. It was outstanding presentation. We've got really, um, we've had a lot of um, excellent comments in the chat. Um, it was really informative. All the prep design was excellent. Thank you so much for your time and for your effort and your dedication and your contribution to dentistry. I hope Thank that we again. will continue to give us some more lectures from New York. We're okay. sorry you couldn't come to London because this was the this was the weekend that you were supposed to be in London last weekend, and then yeah, COVID no, got I in the way. I was, about we to, I was looking forward to it too. Yeah. But, we were going yeah, to have but, a hands-on, guys. So everybody who's here in the presentation, we were going to do a hands-on. What we're going to do next week is we're going to follow up with a digital staining of veneer from direct from the lab from Viva Dent in Leicester, although Leicester's in lockdown. Leo the um, tutor will, will do a direct staining of veneers straight from his lab as a live presentation next time. And we hope, Richard, one day we can welcome you to London, but we look forward to more presentations with you, and we look forward to seeing you in London soon. Definitely. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well, and yeah. thank you so much. Really excellent. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for joining, and we'll put the more information on the WhatsApp group for the next one. BJ, we've let, we've um, recorded the lecture, so you'll be able to see it. It will be on the website lindagreenwell.com, and um, we'll send you a link so you can join. So Fantastic. we'll say thank you so much, everybody, um, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much.